My next talk will be about something that I call a portable occultation kit. Um, basically, this is the set of the camera and the set of equipment of accessories that I that I put together in order to use the new uh, Mighty Eagle Astro camera in the field for mobile deployments to leave them uh, leave it out in the field. Um, I've for those of you in the room uh, the the crate with all the equipment in it that I created with the dividers is up on the front table, but for it, I have pictures of it in the presentation, so you'll be able to see it there as well, but afterwards you can come up and take a look at it. And I've got all the pieces of the kit uh, that we're going to offer for the Night Eagle Astro camera on the front table as well. So I just hold it up in front of the camera? Well, I'll have pictures of it in the presentation, but yeah, thanks. Okay, um, so here it is. Um, uh, in, in, in a previous, when I was using uh, PC-164 cameras, yeah, go back one. That's the... It's, it's got a mind of its own here. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Um, the, uh, in order to remember whether I had all the pieces and parts with me, I, I created, I put all the pieces I needed into a crate and then took a photograph of that set of gear and pasted the picture in the bottom of my, of the, the, the plastic uh, tray so I could just put things on the pictures and then I'd know I hadn't left anything home. So I did the same thing here. Oh, no, I can, we can just go back one hand a second here. It, it's advancing. Yeah, all right, we're back. So the uh, the little stick computer. So I want to give full credit to, to Joan Dunham. Uh, last year, Joan came and presented uh, her original research work on using uh, stick computers in the field with um, analog to digital frame captured frame grabbers, uh, and then. Russ McCormick went ahead and wrote this wonderful, useful program called IOTA Video Capture that allows you to uh, set up a timed start and stop to capture an event on one of these little stick computers. And you do that programming at home before you go out in the field. When you go to the field, all you have to do is push the button to boot the computer and walk away. Uh, I've got, if you set it up the way I recommend, then I've got a set of instructions that I'll put up on the web. So you, you simply set up the Windows 10 to start IOTA Video Capture at boot time. Uh, you don't need a keyboard or a screen in the field. You do all that at home, and you just boot the machine up, push the button when the blue light comes on, you put the cover on and walk away. It boots itself up, and IOTA Video Capture starts counting down, and it starts the recording and stops the recording and does all that for you. Uh, so this is the computer that I... I used, uh, Joan used a different model. I picked this Lenovo computer just because I used to work for IBM and I know that Lenovo makes pretty good stuff so I gave it a try. It's about a hundred bucks now on on uh, eBay or Amazon and uh, seems to be quite reliable. It runs Windows 10, it comes with two gig of RAM. This is pretty much the standard configuration for all these little stick computers. Two gig of RAM, a 32 gig solid state drive inside of it, um, a USB port. Um, it runs on 5 volts from a micro SD uh, card, uh, battery, battery pack. So you don't need a 12 volt battery pack to run the, the computer. Um, and it turns out that the um, run, Night Eagle Run, uh, Night Eagle uh, Astro camera also runs anywhere from 5 to 17 volts. So I can run both the computer and the camera off the same um, rechargeable battery pack, which uh, you'll see in the pictures, uh, which is a 5-volt battery pack, the kind that you buy to recharge your cell phone when you're out of power. And it has USB plugs in it, and you supply your own cable. Um, I did add a 32 gigabyte micro SD card in the micro SD slot uh, because um, with Windows, there was only about 5 or 6 gig free space on the, quote, C drive. So by putting in a micro SD card, you can you have 32 or 64 gig of space for your recordings. 
And each one's about 10 gigabytes with compression. So you can get, you know, you can get two or three and leave them there and not run out of space. But I clean it up after every event to make sure I, I don't run out of space. Okay, next one, please. Um, so yeah, so here's what the uh, what the tray looks like. Uh, the batteries in the upper left there, um, uh, and I've got a 12 volt battery pack um, in there because of course you you need to power the VTI, and so that's in there as well. Uh, the VTI is not in this in this case, um, and all the all the little pieces are there. And then on the right side. Those are the pictures of the things that are supposed to be in the, each little hole. So that's how I know when something's missing and where to put it. Next one, please. Um, so here, here are the additional components, the Night Eagle Astro camera, the 12 volt battery holder for the VTI, uh, an RCA cable, you need a jumper, a little USB hub, because we've got two things we have to power and only have one USB port. So that little passive USB hub works fine. I, that one's from Radio Shack. That you can get them from anywhere. Uh, the StarTech SVID2 USB 23 video capture device that Joan discovered was good quality and didn't drop frames. And um, one of these interesting little gizmos, it's a USB to DC power plug uh, cable made by StarTech. Uh, so, uh, this is how you can take five volts out of your recharge my cell phone battery from a USB plug and use it to power your Night Eagle camera, which expects a M type 12 volt power plug, the, the same power plug that's used to power the VTI. But that cable will carry five volts just as easily as it carries 12. So, so we're able to use that little converter. It's a it's a nice piece of gear. And here's everything um, assembled. Uh, so we've got the the battery down there, and there's a there's one micro USD cable going from the battery around the bottom and then up into that thing labeled two. That's the that's the uh, Lenovo stick computer. So that's power supply for that. The white cable goes to the USB hub. The camera output, um, I'm sorry, the StarTech frame grabber is plugged into that. And then the camera output goes through the pink jumper cable and goes into the StarTech yellow video in uh, cable. And then there's power coming out of the, uh, the other uh, port of the battery uh, through that USB to DC power cable converter that goes into the red plug that powers your camera. So with all that done, you are ready to plug the camera into your telescope um, and, and basically walk away. Now you do want to check focus. So you probably, what I do is I carry along a portable LED TV, a little battery powered television. And I take that camera output out of the frame grabber and stick it into the into the TV and make sure things are in focus and do my pre-point and all that stuff. And then once you're done with that, just just uh, plug it back in to the to the frame grabber and, and you're done. Uh, can you include that in your notes with your presentation that you wish low battery power monitor you're using? Okay, yeah, Steve's asked if I could include in my notes which battery powered monitor I use and sure. Sure, it's a little seven-inch standard LED. Uh, you just have to make sure that it allows for um, an AV input uh, because that's the key to getting this. It's always good to hear when someone's actually using it. Works well. That's what's going to. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. It, mine's having to be made by RCA, and I'll be glad to put a picture of it in this presentation. I'll add that in. Yep. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Okay. Next one. Thanks. Um, so yeah. So I found. Um, Joan uh, did some research and, and, and found a couple of nice pieces of gear. One is a Bluetooth uh, monitor, and another one's a Bluetooth keyboard. So with those two pieces of gear in the field, they're, they're each powered by their own independent battery packs. Uh, she can boot Windows up and make modifications to things like the, uh, uh, the time of starting of the event and so on right in the field if there's uh, some change she had to make. Uh, you can also check focus that way by just bringing up IOTA video capture on the screen and it shows you the current output from the camera so you can focus your telescope that way as well. Um, I didn't have that, but I did find a program that 
called Tumon USB that lets an iPad serve as uh, the, the monitor for a Windows computer through the Apple cable. So all I do is plug the monitor, the iPad, into the, an extra port on the USB hub, boot the computer up, and the Windows screen appears on the iPad, and you can, you can uh, just touch it, and equi that's the equivalent of mouse taps. Uh, you can click the Start button and start programs. The only thing you can't do is, is type, because there's no, there's no uh, keys. <laughs> you can get a keypad. Uh, so I have, a, I have a little Bluetooth keypad and a USB keypad that I bring, uh, a keyboard that I bring along for that. But this, you know, since I already had an iPad, I didn't have to spend a couple hundred bucks on a Bluetooth monitor. That was, so they, don't, they don't have an ability to bring up a little keypad on the iPad? Uh, there are some apps that do and some that don't. Okay. So you, you don't want to get stuck in, in the place. But, um, uh, yeah, so the, the little, I have a little Bluetooth um, keyboard that works pretty well, if it'll connect. It's been a little flaky, so I'm kind of thinking I'm just going to bring one that sticks into the USB hub, and then I know it's going to work. So it's nice to have the ability to make those changes in the field and to use this to focus. If you use this to focus your telescope, you don't need the LED television screen. You can just do it right on here by bringing up IOTA video capture and seeing what it's displaying, and you focus it, and you're done. OK, next one. Uh, we might be close to the end here. Oh, so here's a picture of the monitor. Uh, this is the iPad being the Windows computer monitor with the, all the little menu screens of IOTA video capture up on the screen. And if a camera were attached, then that big gray square in the upper right would be showing us what the camera was, was receiving at the moment. OK. That's it. That's it. So um, yeah, so that, that was a cool program, Tumon USB. It's available for, I think it might be you know, $2.99 on the, on the App Store. Um, you do need to install the Apple. On the iPad, you need to install uh, iTunes. Uh, in order to get some drivers that make it work. What's now, the, what's the, hardware um, the hardware connection is the white USB cable that basically charges an iPad. Oh, really? The standard Apple Lightning connector. That's all it needs. That's all it needs. Yeah. But um, I didn't want to install iTunes, full iTunes, on that little stick computer. I didn't know if there would be enough space, and I knew that it would always try to come up and do stuff. So I did find on the web a place where you could strip out just the drivers from the iTunes libraries and install just the necessary four driver programs. Worked like a charm, so I'll put that in this presentation as well. So the I iTunes drivers are on there that lets Windows talk to the, to the iPad and, and lets Tumon USB serve as the monitor, but iTunes is not running in the background and using up cycles and space and everything else. I didn't need that. So that's all I have, and I see some questions. Ted. Um, it sounds like <clears throat> the only part that isn't in this in this kit is um, the, the exact GPS time. Are you relying on the stick computers? Ah, okay, good question. The, the question is, wh where's the where's the timestamp coming from? Yeah, um, because. We, well, to go back to the, the way we can do time stamping with the old uh, Canon ZR cameras, the Canon ZR camera has its own built-in clock that puts that secret time stamp in a secret track right on the tape. So you can time stamp early and time stamp late and interpolate between the two and all that. But IOTA VTI, IOTA Video Capture doesn't do any of that. So the only way to time stamp this is to have a VTI in the loop and powered on and running. So um, that's a requirement. It doesn't fit in the case, though, it's not, so it's not in the picture. But you have to have one of those for, for each, each one. Um, the, 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 um, the, I, the stick computer does have its own clock, a battery-powered clock, seamless clock, that stays running even when it's powered off. And that is good enough for triggering the recording, because there you need five minutes before, five minutes after. And I actually have the Dimension 4 program installed. So when I boot that up and I'm near a Wi-Fi hotspot, it does go out and reset the clock to current GPS time. But it only loses a few seconds a week. So it's, always, it's usually good enough for the triggering part, which, is, which doesn't need to be that accurate. But for time stamping, yeah, you, you, this is, there's, Windows is still 
you know, completely unacceptable for depending on the Windows clock to timestamp videos. So we have to have a VTI in the loop. Um, Russ did add um, the ability to have a GPS puck plugged into your USB hub. And uh, that's what got me in trouble with Tony and that uh, particular uh, Burnhamia event, because it turns out that plugging in another USB device, even though it's a low bandwidth device, USB just divides the bandwidth in half between the two requesters, regardless of how much they need. So that's why I got all kinds of drop frames and duplicated frames on the data side that I cared about. The only thing that is used for the GPS is at the end of your event, he writes the latitude, longitude, and elevation into your log file for you. So you don't have to go switch the switch and put it onto the tape, right? That was great, except it screws up your data collection. So I don't, I don't, I think that's built into the GPS design to just divide the bandwidth up evenly among everybody who's plugged in. And if that's the case, then we're not going to be able to use that nice feature. We're just going to have to write it down, <laughs> which is, you know, it's much better than having duplicated frames and messing up your data collection. So I'm going to do some experiments, make sure that's the case, but we're pretty sure that's what happened. Yeah. Other questions online or anywhere else? Um, how about an HDMI monitor? Yeah, an HDMI monitor would work well because uh, underneath the little cover, yeah, I can even show this on the TV as well, underneath the cover of the stick is an HDMI, yeah, is an HDMI plug. Exactly. You would basically take this and go behind your television and stick it into an unused port or use a little extension cord if it wouldn't fit. And, and Windows pops up on your television screen and that's all you need to be a monitor for one of these things. Once you plug in a power supply. It's been a little less convenient to find a portable USB, portable HDMI monitor. You're out there with a little flaky, power's an issue. Right. So, as Steve says, portable HDMI, portable HDMI monitors are a little harder to find, and heavier and bigger and take more power, and you got an extra battery. So, that, but if you find one, let us know what you use, because that would be a nice little solution. You got a nice one? Seven inch okay, so so John's going to tell us all about that, and we'll put it on the website. I'll put it in this presentation. It's got a, a good seven inch one. All righty. All right. So uh, thank you, Joan, for all your work. That was really awesome. And uh, an old Canon ZR or Allura camcorder works for a monitor too, if you still have one. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, that's true. You can plug that into the AV in port, and if you can see your stars on that little screen, uh, I lost the ability to do that a couple of years ago. That's why I like the big iPad, nice high-res retina display. That's, that helps a lot. Okay, thank you.